Hello and welcome to the webinar, Ready, Set, Go, The Road to Meaningful Use of EHRs. My name is Melissa DeSoto and I'll be acting as MC for today's webinar, which is a production of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, made possible by a national cooperative agreement from the Bureau of Primary Healthcare in the Health Resources and Services Administration of HHS. This is a one-hour presentation with the last 15 minutes reserved for Q&A. Below the presentation slide, there is a chat box for participant questions and contact information for our phone support tech, Morgan Porter, who is available to address any technical issues by phone. Please type your questions into the chat box at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session with our facilitator for today's webinar, Ms. Anna Gard. The PowerPoint presentation and recording of this webinar will be posted on our website, www.nhchc.org, within three business days. Thank you for joining us today to learn more about the meaningful use of electronic health records. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Today we are really excited to have three wonderful speakers to address the issue of meaningful use in health information technology. Today's workshop is called Ready, Set, Go, The Road to Meaningful Use in Electronic Health Records. We're focusing particularly on safety net and healthcare for the homeless communities. We have Noelle Parker, who's from the Missouri Primary Care Association, and she is from their regional extension center. She'll speak to you about meaningful use and also what the regional extension centers do to support grantees in their transformation of uh, using electronic health records. We have Stephanie Luther, who is the medical director of Heartland Health Outreach, an HCH grantee in Chicago, and she's going to talk about their journey to meaningful use. And Dr. Fred Rockman, who is the chief executive officer of Alliance of Community Health Centers, which is a health center control network, and he is also a board member member of HIMSS and will give us some overview of some helpful tools that comes from HIMSS as well as um, some helpful tools and uh, support that uh, you can look for from your health center control networks. So I would like to welcome Noelle to start off our protection. Good afternoon. My presentation is on information is on the overview of meaningful use as well as what are the regional extension centers able to do for you and your um, providers. Um, the first thing is, is, as you all are probably familiar with, is the uh, High Tech Act and the American Recovery Act of 2009 for the funding that roll out the meaningful use incentives. And there are obviously two tracks. There's one for Medicare and there's one for Medicaid. The money that was uh, set aside for providers to uh, achieve meaningful use was basically, it's, it's seed money. You know, they realized that providers weren't really going after EHR systems and adopting it and embracing it, so they needed to set some money aside that, so that people would embrace it and also have funding to help them transition during that time. So while they were doing that, and ONC and CMS says that's, you know, we're putting money aside for that is, well, what are we, what's our goals? What are we going to do with the EHR systems? Well, there was three main goals that they wanted to accomplish or we want to accomplish is, is one is using your certifi certified, and when I say certified, EHR systems, there's a lot out, out there, but not all are what they call ONC certified. So in order to become a meaningful user and receive those CINEM payments, you need to obtain a certified EHR system. With that EHR system, there's three things that you want to be able to do with it. You should be able to use it in a meaningful way that's going to help improve the safety for your patients, or it's going to improve coordination of care for your patients. That's e-prescribing, that's uh, exchange of clinical data, from either one provider externally or from your other ambulatory care type services, hospitals, um, social services, those different types of things. Being able to exchange information with each other so you can provide that continuum of care as well as the quality of care. 
health information exchange was the second part is you know using certified technology again to be able to improve the quality of care by exchanging it if you have information about a patient that's there with you you can obviously make better informed decisions on how, on the care that you want to provide. Um, my years of practice management, the one thing that I hear all the time, especially was from providers is, well, if I don't have a chart, I can't make a decision. I don't know what medication there are. I don't know what. So without that information, it, it inhibits people from helping patients with their care. The third is being able to actually show clinical quality measures and being able to report out on how are you doing? How are your, par your patients uh, improving in their care? What does your population base looks like? What we're seeing is a transition is moving away from your encounter-based care to obviously population health reporting. So there's three stages of meaningful use. Currently we're in stage one and that is to 2014. The first stage, which we are currently, is just to begin down that road of using an EHR system, getting data into your EHR system, capturing it, and then start to be able to report out on it. Second stage is you're going to hopefully be able to use it to use reports that will drive change, uh, implement changes in your environment that is going to improve the quality of care for your patients. And the third is improved outcomes. Once you can utilize your system, you've got data in there, you can report on it, you could track it, you can make changes, you can drive those desired outcomes. The five pillars of meaningful use are fundamental here. And the way I look at it is when I talk to other people about this is, you know, these are the reasons why you want to do this. What is, what's in it for you, what's in it for the patient? First is, is driving the quality of care for patients as well as being, you know, the safety of your patients, efficiency, and reducing those health disparities. And that's most important, especially around patient-centered medical home, this ties in. Engaging patients and families in the care, this ties into patient-centered medical home as well. Improving care coordination is um, another one of the pillars. Improve population and public health. The last one is ensuring privacy and security of personal health information. As I mentioned, MPCA is a partner with the Regional Extension Center for Missouri. There are many regional extension centers across the United States, and what the regional extension centers are there is to provide assistance to you to help you with your EHR getting from, and we say from soup to nuts, uh, you know, from identifying a vendor. Many of the regional extension centers has group purchasing agreements with various EHR vendors where they have worked out pricing details, where they have worked out contract language um, to help people out there when they're looking for an EHR system, that it protects them. One of the things that uh, we, you know, the biggest concern was, you know, I, I have EHR vendors and they want me to purchase something. They'll tell you everything comes in a nice little package. When you start to sign on the contract, you're finding out they're going to add this module, that module. So the REC was trying to be an unbiased, um, unbiased person that can come in and help you identify vendors, give you, um, give you suggestions on, you know, you need to be aware of this type of contract language. This is the thing that you're going to be needing to achieve meaningful use. RECs do a lot of education. They do a lot of webinars to help you learn what is meaningful use. We have a series called EHR Jumpstart. So if you haven't even started down this road, it educates you from the very basic. What is meaningful use? Why is it valuable? What are the incentives? And how do you get started? Um, they also provide tools. There's many tools. We have various assessments tools that we will use when we go out with working with providers or grantees to get an idea of where are you at today in regards to EHR adoption. Or if you're already on an EHR, where are you at in achieving me meaningful use? Where are those gaps? And that helps you understand 
what you're going to need to do to meet meaningful use and beyond. So it's it's a very good resource. They offer a lot of different resources. They offer um, from you know practice flow analysis to gap analysis to EHR selections to education to even helping you register when you're going after those incentive payments. There's a lot of different services that they do offer, and I highly encourage you to check out your regional extension center for that. I have put some resources here in case you don't know who your regional extension center is that will tell, give you an idea of where to go. For instance, the regional extension center locator, there's a couple of them that you actually can go into these, put your zip code in, and I'll tell you who your regional extension center is and point you in the right direction. So I'm going to take us down another uh, cut and becoming a little bit more um, on the ground and uh, build towards Stephanie, who's really going to talk about what it's actually like uh, in practice. And um, I'm going to go over a little bit of what Noel uh, talked about. What I would like to do is begin by focusing on the context for all of this as we look a little bit more deeply at some of the requirements and how that's relevant to uh, the values and the care that we uh, deliver in our setting. Uh, and do that before we start to look at some challenges, because I think it's important to know why are we doing all this. What's most important is how we actually are able to use that technology to transform the care we're delivering. And our country is making a you know, a huge investment in us doing exactly that. So uh, we'll go through some of the requirements and hopefully uh, begin to look at some of the relevance, identify some of the challenges, and then describe um, the role and, uh, of, of uh, health center controlled networks. I'll recap a little bit what uh, Noel's already covered. Also, uh, just a, a couple of the remarks about regional extension centers and other areas we could go to for work for uh, assistance. So first of all, just by way of context, everybody is kind of overwhelmed by all of these buzzwords. I mean, we've got all these things, patient-centered medical home, meaningful use, accountable care organizations, health information exchange, all of these things. And all of them really are aimed at health system change. I mean, I would remind everybody that the funding for a lot of these things is actually coming out of a response to an economic crisis. And uh, we all know that a large responsibility for that is our health system. And um, we have abysmal performance. Everybody knows that. We have one of the most expensive healthcare systems on the planet. We'd like to think that transfers into outcomes, but guess what? We also have one of the poorest performing healthcare systems in the planet. So everything that we are focused on or should be focused on is about changing that equation, lowering costs and improving quality. And that's the first question I just pitched to you. Everything we're doing, what are the ways that those things can actually do that? I have this slide to remind myself. I, this is a, a level set for myself in any talk about what are we actually talking about quality, because it tends to be a buzzword. I love these dimensions from the um, uh, Institute of Medicine. They say that everything we do should, first of all, be safe. We shouldn't do any harm. Uh, they should be, it should be uh, effective, so we shouldn't do anything that isn't known to have some uh, impact that's uh, positive. Um, it should be timely, so the best intervention, if it's too late or in the wrong time frame, is not going to uh, be helpful uh, or optimal. It should be efficient. We all know that. In our settings, we have very limited resources. We don't make the most uh, use of those resources. But also, uh, this calls upon us to make most efficient use of our patients' time and resources. So I urge us all to be thinking about efficiency in those terms as well. Are we doing things in the way that makes the best use of their time? Uh, and resources, uh, and that uh, I, as one dimension of patient-centeredness, uh, making sure that everything is focused at the convenience and at the um, benefit of the patients, and it's amazing when we go around to healthcare organizations, how many of our policies and procedures really are, are really constructed or our processes are really constructed around our convenience <laughs> or our benefit and not necessarily the patient. And then finally, it should be equitable. Uh, and that meaning all the usual things about race, ethnicity, and background. But also, the other thing about equitable is that no matter what care setting or what provider or what time of day or where you live, you should also be uh, entitled to the same uh, quality of care. 
So um, Noel went over the meaningful use goals. Um, uh, most people have seen these, um, but I want to sort of translate them into a vision for where this is aiming. So where we're hoping is that we're going to come into the modern age with information technology, so it's no longer locked in um, uh, unreadable uh, volumes of, uh, of information that's locked in individual charts that no one has the time to look at or can't often find or isn't available when a patient moves from one place to another, to information that actually follows us as patients, that's available at the point of care in the right time to inform decision making all across the board that we're able to use modern information technology to augment our poor limited human brains to assimilate all of the characteristics and complexities of the patient along with the continuous evolution of medical knowledge and science to provide some assistance to us as caregivers to make the right decision for that patient at the right time. And that same uh, capability can be ported to us as consumers or patients so that we can have, think of other areas of your life other than healthcare, where we've come to use modern technology to assist us in making decisions for buying plane tickets or choosing uh, hotels or to uh, make decisions about movies or things like that. Uh, Population-based data, um, uh, Noel talked a little bit about this. Again, one of the limitations of paper information is we were not able to see trends or look at populations in terms of what that the individual points of data we had from patients were telling us about our care or the needs of patients or the efficacies of treatments. And finally, broadcasting back out trends in terms of the quality of what we're doing so that the motivation all across the board for people begins to be, decision makers, policy makers, administrators, begins to be quality because since that's transparent and out in front of everyone, that's going to matter more than the bottom line. Please don't take notes, don't try to look at all the detail here, it's just by way of illustration. But what we have now are these granular set of measures that are prompted, that are at this point, stage one, meant to guide us to be sure that we're using the technology in ways that we capture and transmit information in standardized ways. So what it's, look, if you look at some of the detail, if you could read this eye chart, it says things like we're maintaining problem lists, we're maintaining medication lists, we're capturing orders um, electronically. All of this is predicated on taking as many of the care elements and what we're doing on a daily basis, capturing that data in standardized ways, putting it into the technology in such a way that it is then available for those kinds of higher level analytics and exchange. A simple way to think about it is what we've done in other realms where we've automated things. So think of what happened when we went from a written document to a Word document, right? We've done some basic things of making it legible. You can cut and paste. Um, we could establish some templates and some guidelines so that we could have an outline that we're filling in that, so that everybody could fill things in in the same order or ways. But then think of a Word document becoming an Excel document or, an, or, or kind of an access database document. Now we're going to a next level, right? Because now we have to enter into each point on that spreadsheet a certain type of data in a certain format. So it can do things like add or subtract or multiply or do kinds of various kinds of uh, uh, analytics and give us some new information. That's exactly where we're aiming with the technology now. So right now, we're training our providers or we're learning as providers to move from that cryptic chart where we could write and however we wanted and who cared about if anyone read it and this belongs to me and I decide what I put in there. We're moving from that to the idea that this is now, I need to be paying attention to what I put in there because if not, if that record goes to perform a, an analytic or a, to measure the quality of what I'm doing, if I don't do it right and I don't capture it right, nothing is going to work. Now, what's really interesting is everybody is struggling with meaningful use stage one. 
But I just am highlighting for you one of the little things here from the eye chart about what the measure in stage one actually says. It says that 80% of patients have at least one entry recorded as structured data. So those of you that use an Excel spreadsheet, what would happen if you said, well, only one of the cells on that page needs to have the right kind of number in it, and you can do whatever you wanted with the other cells? You would not have a functional worksheet, right? So this is the reality of where we really are with these measures as we're struggling to meet them. So where are things going next? So many of you may know that the the, uh, the hint of where we're going with stage two measures, which by the way have been delayed for another year because everybody says it's not, we're not ready to do it. Um, stage two measures uh, involve moving some of the optional, so in stage one we had some measures that we could defer, we could do later, um, we could choose some that we were picking. So in stage two, everybody has to do everything and we've increased those thresholds a bit beyond uh, where they were on that first slide, but still not, nobody's aiming to 100% yet in all of these things. So um, as we're struggling with these, I really want to make the pitch to you if everyone buys into where we're going, these are the test questions that we're looking at in meaningful use. Let's really be thinking beyond these test questions and what we have to do to get those incentive dollars and be where everyone in this room, I think, really wants to be, which is how are we going to use the technology to transform care? I'm going to slip, skip over these test measures because I really want us to get to Stephanie, um, who's going to bring this home to what it's like to actually try to implement this in our care settings. This is actually transforming the way we think about care and what we do. So um, the other thing I just want to highlight is that there's a lot of debate going on now about quality measures. And we went from a very a relatively small set of measures to now a large number proposed. I really want everyone to be paying attention to this debate because quality measures and how they're, how they're determined are going to have a very big impact both on what we do and how the care that we're delivering is measured and also what people are going to be paying attention to. So in this room especially, I just want to make the pitch for all of you to be paying attention as the debate goes on over the next several months about what those measures are. Are they relevant in our population? Do we think they are relevant in our populations? Are there others that maybe would be more relevant? And also, are they ones that we feel we could accurately um, collect that would be a, a, a good representation of both the health status of our patients and what we're doing? So. What are all the implications of this? So first of all, um, definitely, as we said, increased uh, transparency and documentation, new ways that we're going to have to interact with our patient. Um, there is, uh, both through uh, what's being discussed in meaningful use measures and the patient-centered medical home, more of an emphasis on longitudinal care plan and how that aims to uh, outcomes. So not so much that assessment and plan around today's visit, but how does it relate to a longer term roadmap for the patient? Definitely this focus on qualities and outcomes. Increasing focus on patient use of technology. So we talked about that one example, but uh, in the draft measures for meaningful use too is the requirement that we have patient portals in use for our patients. And in some of the populations that we deal with, that means taking on the burden of making sure that that technology is accessible and usable for our patients because otherwise technology may actually exacerbate health disparities if we don't pay attention or look at some of this. And then finally, implicit under all of this is more of a focus on what happens between the visits. So our responsibility as care providers to be looking at not just at what's happening in that encounter, but between visits. And I know that in healthcare for the homeless programs, you, we are a step ahead because we probably always have been focused more on that. But it's going to come more and more uh, a, an, an expectation in, uh, in the healthcare system. So again, um, achieving meaningful use is uh, the focus is, is implementing and supporting technology, but the aim is really around transforming care. And I just want to acknowledge that as we're going through this, we are in this funny, funny place, almost impossible place, 
And we're dealing with it as providers, we're dealing with administrators, we're getting this pushback because all of what we talked about is aiming at equipping people for a reimbursement system that looks different than it looks today. An accountable care environment where we're paid for outcomes and where it doesn't matter so much what the little widgets or unit of service are. Uh, and where quality is recognized over, again, the, the number of units of services. But guess what? Today, we're still being paid in the old paradigm. So as we're trying to implement the technology and the care processes, we're caught in this place. I can't make it better for anyone in the room, but I think we need to recognize it. And my, the, the, the biggest caution is to make sure that we realize the decisions we're making today are investments in that future reimbursement system. And to be very, very careful that we don't compromise that by being too focused on you know, how things are working for us today. But all of it is based on this set of um, functions that we talked about. Uh, this clinical decision support, so the ability of the system to prompt care, the right care based on what we know about the patient and what we know about medical knowledge. The ability to aggregate information in ways and present it in ways that we can use it to manage populations. Quality reporting. Um, electronic prescribing and health information exchange as being the ways that uh, we are taking responsibility that the care we're delivering within our institution is up to date as the patient moves from where we are to other points of the healthcare system. And then finally, again, the patient access technology. Now, I just want to give you a little real world snapshot. Um, we did a study in uh, my organization of HIV measures, and this is just a little feedback on where we are with this capturing and storing data, which is what everything is predicated on. And we looked at the measures, these are HIV measures, uh, I presume many of you in the room are responsible for reporting some of these measures. And we did an automated report out of the uh, electronic record system. And then we did a manual review and actually looked at the documentation and the record and validated it. And what you can see that in some cases there was good alignment, but in other cases there was quite a difference data entry, data not being entered, put it in the wrong place, right, definitions not being right, there are a number of factors. So um, these are some of the questions. So we're getting in phase one. So this is where everybody should be heads down right now as you're in the process of uh, critiquing your EMR use or you're about to adopt. Is the documentation consistent? Are we all documenting consistently? Are the relevant data elements actually being captured as structured data? Or is it a structured field, but the provider is writing something in because that's more convenient or more comfortable? Or in some cases, our providers think that's better information because it's more detailed. You know, so is it, is it being right? Where in the workflow is it captured so we're not driving ourselves crazy? You know, are we capturing it at the more efficient, most efficient and best place in the workflow? Um, and um, where we're aiming, so to what will make it uh, meaningful for providers to be engaged in capturing data like this is they can see why it's useful. So are we actually using within the workflow the clinical decision support so people say, oh, wait a minute, if I enter this in, in the right place, this is going to tell me now what my patient needs over here, so maybe it's worth doing it. So these are some questions for you to be asking at this stage of where we are in what you're doing. So you talked about this. What are some of the challenges to data variable uh, validity? And I also want to just vet for you where the software is. Um, we have a lot of challenges. Our uh, vendors are still uh, trying to keep up with learning and advancing uh, what needs to be done and what the capabilities um, need to be in order to facilitate um, the work that we're trying to do. And it's not efficient and it's not, it's, it's, it's cumbersome. So, um, but if you look at other forms of technology, if you look at the development of, say, the cell phone um, and, uh, and how that's evolved, um, it's been through use. It's as people use 
the technology that it um, that that the uh, vendor community is able to advance and improve it. So that's realistically where we are. We still probably have that big brick. Those of you that are old enough to remember those early cell phones. All right. So where are we as a where is we as a nation? Like, what's our set of adoption? So. Um, we've been measuring this for a while. If you look at just ask the question, how many people have an EMR at all, we're probably inching up over 50% of care settings. But if you start to look down more deeply into some of the functions that we've been talking about, we're still only probably around 10%. Um, things like uh, medical history and follow-up notes being recorded in some kind of uh, structured way, uh, drug interactions actually being functional or being used, uh, computerized orders for lab tests and test orders being sent electronically, these simple things push us down into that 10% range. So we're still pretty early uh, in this process. Just a quick uh, inventory of some of the things that are needed, not only for the initial adoption of the EMR, but ongoing. So um, I also want to talk about health center controlled networks, which is what my uh, organization is. This is a response of uh, HRSA uh, for their funded programs. And um, they are, it's, an, it, it's an encouragement of the individual centers to work together and rather than to do things individually, to pool resources, to have a common infrastructure that they use. Uh, they're required to be controlled actually by community health centers. There have to be at least three participants and it is required that they demonstrate there is some key function that is actually integrated. The way we like to think about it is if you took that network out, health centers would hemorrhage because part of their you know, core bodily functions are being performed together as a group. Uh, one way to think of it is that um, otherwise health centers would need to procure these resources directly in the vendor market. What the network allows the centers to do is to come together and build some kind of infrastructure uh, that helps uh, procure those services. Um, and um, takes on some of the services that a vendor might do uh, and does them in a more health center responsive and specific way. At the same time, the health center is taking some of the functions they would have to pay to do and they're investing in the network infrastructure to accomplish that. And finally, the network will also do some things that otherwise would never get done. It's also how they're funded, by the way. Some of it comes out of discounts from the vendor so that that uh, money does not come from the health centers, but the health centers, by buying these things together, get a less price so that money can go um, in to be used for their infrastructure. Uh, some of the money is the contribution of the health centers, and then some of it comes from grant funding and other uh, support. Why, why is it that uh, people might consider coming together in a centrally hosted approach to an EMR? Well, um, as you can see, the, uh, the process is daunting. It improves the uh, likelihood of success by pooling all the, uh, all the uh, uh, approaches and resources and intelligence of the health centers, which you're about to hear about. Um, allows access for more uh, sophisticated support. It does reduce cost. It still remains staggeringly expensive, but less than it would be. Improves a profile with the vendor because now it's a large buyer group. Um, and then um, also is this opportunity for clinical sharing and more standardization of how we approach things. So our network um, came together with the National Association of Community Health Centers and two other networks to form a new enterprise. Um, to um, offer uh, services that um, would assist uh, safety net health centers in this uh, morass of uh, HIT adoption. And again, the sort of a landscape of services and in some ways a matchmaker function helping to identify where there are resources and um, that might meet needs of health centers as well as providing some kinds of direct services. Um, it's a new adventure, and you can uh, find it uh, on the last website there, www.thqlink.org. I do want to also uh, mention, as Anna said, hymns. This is the place where vendors and consumers of health information technology and policymakers all come together. 
Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing place where we can uh, be collaborating and working and identifying issues. Um, it also, it's a volunteer effort largely, and there's a whole set of toolkits that you can find on the website. Now, many of them you can only access if you are a member, but the good news is that all of you in this room are eligible for a free membership. There is a not-for-profit membership category in HIMSS, so go to hymns.org and you will be able to find out how to do that. Thanks to Noel and Fred for setting me up so well. And I get a chance to really kind of focus more on our healthcare for the homeless aspect. So Heartland Health Outreach, we've had our EMR in place since 2006 and I'd like to say we were in that 15% of the highly optimized, high functioning group. And I think in a lot of ways we are, um, but what we've really realized is it's an ongoing process. You don't just plug it in, play and, and um, be done with it. So I'm going to talk more about really the nuts and bolts of what we're doing at the ground level to try to achieve meaningful use and how you take this vision that we've been talking about to back to your organization so that you can actually get the money. Um, these are the quotes that I've heard around our organization um, about what is meaningful use. There's still not a lot of good, solid information. I think people get overwhelmed when they look at a 150-page information booklet from, from CMS on it. Um, I had one person, these are all actual quotes, just another indicator. I was like, oh, no, it's a little bit more than that. Uh, does it really impact care? And I think both Noel and Fred really went over this as, to me, this is one of the first times a, a program really merges things like IT and actually the good quality care that, that we want to be giving. And finally, they're putting some money behind it. It's kind of nice. And the, the last one is that plug and play. Well, don't you just need an EMR and then you're, you're set to go? And the answer is no, not exactly. So definitely be a champion. Take, take this information back to your organization. Get the rest of your team on board. And definitely money talk. So I open up with, this is a lot of money. We need to sit down and talk about this. But my favorite part of really saying is, this is the money, use it as a tool so that we can actually accomplish these quality indicators, which is the good quality care that, that we want to be providing. Um, who's going to do it? It's not just an IT thing. This is everybody. This is really that team-based care. It's really getting together your group, and that includes clinicians, frontline staff, our receptionists, our phone operator is, is in on this, but also our administrative group, the financial folks, and definitely our IT and information um, services. Um, the good news is, if this feels daunting to you, that the first stages are easier to accomplish and there's more money attached to them, so you can actually go back and reinvest that money to um, start to plan um, to achieve stage two and stage three. So we just went through our budget process, and I convinced our director of finance to reinvest that money into project management for us to really achieve stage two and stage three. Um, why us? Why healthcare for the homeless? I think it's the reason we're all here because our population deserves the same good quality health care that everybody else does, and this is our tool to do it. One of our tools, I should say. And then I think what, what Fred was alluding to is that in a lot of ways, healthcare for the homeless already gets this. We really epitomize that team care and that coordination that we think outside of that single visit. Um, and really look at the big picture. So um, I think this really makes sense for us and healthcare for the homeless. Resources, always a problem. So I hope everybody's already thinking about how are we gonna gather those resources at our own organization to, to move this forward. Of course, there's a lot going on, and I think Fred was great at kind of showing us there's so much overlap nicely in these. I did find one statistic that I thought was interesting that all of meaningful use is in patient-centered medical home. Not the reverse, meaningful use doesn't cover all of patient-centered medical home. But one thing that is different for those who are going after PCMH, it's very site-specific. Meaningful use, the reports are actually individual provider-specific. So there is a little bit difference there as you go to, to build your workflows and your processes. Um, 
This part is that ready, set, go. And I think that both Noel and Fred set us up well for this. And I really just want to um, hit home that this really is about transforming your practice and aligning these um, goals with the, the good work that we're already doing. There is a lot of change management going on, so this is about changing people's behavior. I, as a practicing provider, am one of those people who needs to be changed. I can't free text everything I want to do in the HPI section. Um, and, and I think Fred did a good job at really showing the vision and take that back to your teams of why it's so important to actually click the box. I think you're getting a big sense by now that this is a big project, so approach it like you would any other major project that your organization is doing. These are, um, I think, no-brainers here. One thing I will say is the gap analysis. That is one thing that our organization did with the Alliance, uh, our health center controlled network. They actually came in almost as an outsider to do the gap analysis on how we were doing for meaningful use. And it was really helpful for me as the medical director because, oh, no, no, we're great at asking about allergies. Okay, we were good, but we weren't as good as we needed to be. And so it was really helpful to have um, that kind of outsider point of view as well. Uh, it's the time now to not only be looking at the stage one, but there's a lot of preparation that needs to go into effect for stage two and stage three. There's gonna be significant workflow changes probably for your organization, so start thinking about those now so they don't need to be done at the last minute and um, more less painful, hopefully. <laughs> Um, one thing I'd like to highlight here is really that champion um, concept, and we call them a super user for, for our organization in terms of having somebody who is using the EMR and really gets the EMR. So you all know that, and, and I'm not one of those people, I just, got a, I, I just got an iPhone, I'm probably the last person in this room to get one, and I'm not really good at using it. But find those people in your organization who get it, who really understand the data. And whether they are a physician, a case manager, the front desk, we actually, one of our front desk people is awesome at it. And really find ways to make them your champions. They're the ones at the health center. You know, I'm often in a meeting and stuff, so they can really be your champion on site to really deliver this to the whole team. So one thing we did is really reorganize what our quality plan was going to be this year. Um, it's probably going to take a little bit longer than a year to accomplish meaningful use as well as patient-centered medical home, but that was how significant these were to our organization. And it, it took a lot of energy to bring everybody to the table and convince everybody from each different sector that we needed to all be on board with these things. And, and again, for any of those who went from paper to an EMR, you kind of think that, oh, once I'm on the EMR, my quality program is going to be so awesome. I'm going to have all this data. Well, it is. It's awesome to have all this data, but there's a lot more. To, and I don't miss chart audits, by the way, doing paper chart audits at all. But there's a lot more to a quality program than just the plug and play. And not everybody who hasn't worked in that, so like our finance people, um, and our practice administrator needed to really get on board with that as well. So we made it part of our quality program and that was already in our, in our structure. So the last line here I think is key, really kind of making it a culture and, and I think vi um, Fred's point to a vision here is this isn't just about achieving stage one and getting the dollars. This is really about going into our new century um, of healthcare and the use of IT and making it a part of healthcare. So really looking at it as, as the tool and not the, the end point. Um, I think I've gotten to this point, but I use this slide a lot with my team as this is a constant process. You know, we put in the EMR in 2006. How many upgrades have we had since 2006? A lot. So it's a constant process. You're not only upgrading to get better products, but you're upgrading your workflows and actually how you use that, that product. 
uh, this is the data part, and I think the healthcare for the homeless uh, part of this is we do have a lot of providers who tend to work outside the box. That's what makes them great mission-oriented providers. We also do a lot of healthcare delivery in non-traditional settings, so we're on the road with it. And how does that translate into clicking boxes? And and I think Fred actually did probably the best discussion of showing, showing people what the outcome is of them clicking the box. Wow, I can really see how many of our folks had mammograms, and now I can pull those folks who don't have their mammogram up to date right out of the EMR. How cool is that? It is kind of cool, actually. Okay, so one of the things, and this is, I think, my plug for working with your community. In this, in this situation, it's really working with our health center controlled network to um, share the work, but also share the resources and share the experience. So we are the main healthcare for the homeless provider within the network, but I will also say that we gain so much by being with our other safety net providers. So they're obviously learning from us as healthcare for the homeless, but we're learning from them as well. And a couple of the great things that we've done is you do buy a product from a vendor, whether we do it through your, your network or directly. There's lots of modifications to be made to that, particularly things like the templates and um, a couple of things that I'd really push for in terms of what Fred's talking about and change a vision of how we deliver healthcare is this point about building comprehensive templates for care. One of our big pushes is for having an adult visit template, pretty much everything you could need in that template. It's more of an opt out process than an opt in. So for example, as we go through, there are point of care reminders. This particular patient needs their mammogram. Or when I click on our asthma page that's right embedded in there, it will have the evidence-based guidelines and decision-making support right within it. It used to be we actually had to pull some of that in. So you had to say, oh, this is an asthma patient. I need to remember to pull that in. How this helps us is, I don't know about you guys, but we often get caught up in the moment. There is some crisis that's happening in our patients' lives, and we're very focused on that. And often the preventative stuff can kind of get pushed to the side. And so when I went back and looked at my own personal data, I was like, literally, I had less than 30% of my diabetics were on an ACE inhibitor. I'm like, oh, how is that possible? One was I wasn't collecting all the data in the right place. But two, when I really looked seriously at my own charts, it was... Gosh, well, on this visit, I was so worried about their PTSD, which had flared up, that we didn't get to these other things. So make the tool, the EMR, work for you in this case. Um, we started talking about this already in terms of our complex patients. I think staffing is a real interesting area, and it really flows into population management, too. This is a bit of a shift, at least at our organization for healthcare for the homeless. We are so patient centered that most of our care is actually very direct patient care. So most of our staff are really frontline direct patient care staff. And this is again, I had to go back to my, my budget person and say, you know what, we really need a data analyst. We really need a care coordinator who isn't direct patient care, but is the one doing this population management. And I was able to go back to like the health disparities work that was done in, dis in diabetes and such, and remind them that those were great projects. Now we're shifting to this is all of our care. This isn't just one project that we're working on. So we're really mm -hmm. trying to shift more towards um, using the EMR as our tool for healthcare rather than it just being really a typewriter or a way to, to store information. Um, oh, my favorite workflows. Um, it's not my, my favorite thing to do in terms of sit down and write them, and probably my workflows look a lot like this picture in terms of chalk on a chalkboard. But I can't speak enough to how important that process is, even if it is um, difficult and it does take time. But it very quickly shows you where the issues are. So for example, when we did this, it was for meaningful use, but it was also just in general for our staffing and workflow. We kind of just did a whole patient visit, 
and what the workflow was for that, as well as that workflow that needs to happen when the patient isn't at your health center or at your, your outreach sites. And what we found is consistently the majority of the work had to go through the medical provider. And that just doesn't make sense anymore. It doesn't mean that a patient needs to see the physician or the nurse practitioner or PA to get a mammogram order. But when I diagrammed them out this way, it became quite clear that it was. So that was easy for us then to change our workflow in terms of creating standing orders and really spreading out the ability to care for each individual patient across the whole team. And now you can quickly see how this works into meaningful use too. Mm -hmm. Empanelment. So these are the hard things to do. Um, first thing I'm just going to point out is the resource at the bottom, which I, I go back to over and over. It's actually a patient-centered medical home resource for safety net providers. But again, here's a great overlap in meaningful use. This is one of the cruxes of these concepts of team-based care that um, we thought we were doing pretty well at as a healthcare for the homeless. But when we really looked at, again, our diagram, what we were is we were one team rather than individual teams that were assigned to individual patients. That really does make a difference in your workflow. Um, one thing that it helps is really kind of building that medical home concept so that your patient can not only access you as a provider, but every staff member who can actually help them along the way. And um, the other part of that is how do we do this for healthcare for the homeless? For example, our organization, we have one large health center on the north side of Chicago, but our outreach team, which is about half of our patient visits each year, we span the entire city. So we have at least a well, I know for the rural programs this is going to sound silly, but probably a good 15 to 20 mile range. Now, in city terms, that's a long ways. I understand in rural that may not seem far. But um, we may have a patient who is up on the north side and then gets transferred to a different housing, um, supportive housing program on the south side. But me as a provider is a north side you know, we've kind of got our niches and I'm on the north side. So how do we build that team that covers our patients no matter where they're showing up? And again, I think us as healthcare for homeless providers actually understand this as a vision and a mission. But when you put it onto paper, boy, it spent, we spent a lot of time figuring out which, which of our names gets assigned to this chart. And so I, I can walk you through at some point, if anybody wants to, what we did for ourselves. We're still actually refining it. Looks like there's other folks who've had success in this area. It is a good process to go through, and it's actually one of the first things you need to do to actually do some of these others. Outreach, the mainstay of our coordinated care programs for healthcare for the homeless doesn't really fit some of these mainstream models like meaningful use in EHR and, and PCMH very well. So for example, um, it was just two years ago that we finally took our EMR into outreach. That was a significant capital expense for us to get enough uh, computers and systems to get out into outreach with it. Um, but we don't have printers, for example. So when we want to print things, and that's actually one of the meaningful use requirements in stage one is the ability to print off healthcare summaries. So these are things that we need to think about. Anna and I were just talking this morning about um, cut connection issues. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough one. I feel like, and especially we go to such a variety of places that one thing seems to work for one shelter or community site and not for another. I feel like in general, um, homeless living shelters are built in bomb shelter buildings that have thick concrete walls and are in basements and have no um, technology embedded in them. So it's been a, it's been a real big issue um, for us. This is where we reach out to our health center controlled network for their assistance as well. Well, um, so things like we've tried the 3G cards. We actually went to the 4G cards, which work better. Anna was telling me they had to go back to their 3G cards. So a lot of this is, is trying, trying things out, talking to your other healthcare for the homeless colleagues about what's working for them. 
And right now we're actually partnering with our outreach sites as to how can we be healthcare partners, maintain HIPAA compliance, but share in their computer systems. So more to come on that one. Labs is something we just figured out um, doing well. We actually have a vendor, it's Quest Labs um, for us within our health center and we actually just changed our contract with them so that our outreach participants can go to any Quest site anywhere throughout the city. We were actually able to map the Quest sites with our outreach sites on a single map and that has really helped our outreach team say here, here's a Quest site that you could walk to from here rather than getting 10 miles away to our health center. So that's helping us in our continuity and will help us in achieving meaningful use. Okay, health summaries. This was a, is and was a very hot topic for us, and um, Fred and I have had several discussions on this uh, personally as well. So definitely the vision is including the patients in their own health care. We all know that their record is their record, but I think, you know, Fred's point is culturally, though, we have often as providers and organizations felt that it was our record and maybe we'll share it with them. Maybe we'll get around to copying the whole thing when they request it type thing. But um, really, it's using their health record in the visit with them. So we actually show them. We walk through each piece so they can see what we're putting in it. They can see the graph of their blood pressures and such. Um, but one of the meaningful use requirements is printing out these health summaries. Um, we started it as a pilot project, and, and as it's always good to do pilot projects first. Uh, we did hit a few bumps in the road, so a um, couple things that happened. We have very mobile, mobile population um, who live out of their backpacks. So those backpacks get stolen on a fairly regular basis. So when handing this, actually a, a fair number of our patients felt very uncomfortable having you know, their personal medical information, and particularly things like HIV or STI status or their mental health issue on there. They were really excited about having the appointment reminders and stuff, but they wanted to personalize it. And so that's something we came back to, to Fred and his team of how can we make that work for, for everybody. Um, one of the issues that we had that was probably more specific to us, um, since we do have a large uh, number of folks with severe mental illness and with paranoia, uh, we did have patients come back right away and say, I don't have this. You need to take this off my record. And yes, we continue to have that discussion, um, but it is an ongoing discussion. And so those are things to, to pilot out in your own workflow and anticipate them because they're, they're real, but we also need to, to work with them. Um, one of the things that we're piloting right now is having participants sign releases of information ahead of time. We know the typical hospitals that they end up in the emergency room, so we're trying to get those releases on file as a way to expedite this, this sharing of information as well. There is a separate indicator in meaningful use for the electronic um, giving of that information, not only to the patient but to other um, uh, referrals and stuff, but this is an example of working with your rec and your and your health center controlled network, health center controlled network, as well as healthcare for the homeless. This is the feedback that the government needs to get because they weren't necessarily thinking about us. We're the small one percent of the population out there, and so they need to hear this stuff. And I do think that carries over to to the rest of America, actually. Um, one thing that we're looking at, we haven't implemented our patient portal yet, but again, trying to jump on things ahead of time and really thinking about um, how our patients are going to access it. Um, definitely issues around that. Um, if we can afford, we will definitely put the kiosk in the waiting room. I think that's one place. Really working with your community partners where your participants spend a lot more time. That may be the local library. We do have an issue with that. Our local library system requires an ID to get um, their library card, which allows them to get on the computer. So we're advocating right now a way to maybe skip that step for our folks. Um, another issue is privacy at those places. So another example we were talking about is they may access it, um, their 
their health information on a public computer that lots of other people are walking past and really thinking through those privacy issues at your, at your um, community sites. Last plug here is let's work together in this. I think we have definitely started as Heartland Health Outreach on this journey. This is not a one-time journey though. As you saw, this is going to be at least a four to five year project um, to achieve all the levels of meaningful use. And it really is a whole lot more fun and supportive to work together. You are always welcome to email your questions to us directly. And it looks like there aren't any. It was a lot of great content. Please don't hesitate to contact me directly uh, with any feedback, suggestions, or email directly your questions regarding meaningful use. Um, I want to thank you all again for your participation. And thank you to Anna Gard. I'm going to turn the mic over to her. Thank you for all of uh, you who par participated in this webinar. Um, and I certainly want to thank our speakers uh, who came to the National Conference and uh, provided this live. They certainly gave us lots of inf really helpful information. I would encourage all of you who are beginning this journey, thinking about this journey, in the middle of this journey, to make sure you register with CMS. Uh, the CMS link is in the uh, Meaningful Use Resource Catalog that is on, uh, I think Melissa put it on on uh, the link on the bottom Q&A section here. Um, that link will give you all things you need to know about meaningful use, what the requirements are, how to register, how to contact an REC, how to um, attest to meaningful use, and what the financial incentives are for uh, your organization. So I would certainly encourage you to use that as your first step and uh, contact the council for any questions that you may have.